Hi, do you like pigs? Do you like Laser Pig? Do you like invading his privacy at four in the morning and getting into his house where he does all his disgusting breakfast crimes? Don't judge me! Do you like asking him 50 million questions and then getting angry when he doesn't instantly respond? Have I said something incorrect in one of my videos and you're just desperate to make sure that I'm aware of it? Are you one of the several hundred people every day who email me asking for help with your history homework? I wish there was a more personalized way you could contact me other than my email address which is for business inquiries only, guys. Seriously. Well, shut your fucks up because now I finally have a Discord. Yes, now you can finally at me in public and annoy me by causing my computer to make sounds and flash a red number at me to let me personally know that you want to talk to me. And I need to drop everything to read what you said. Link in the description. So come now before I realize what a horrible mistake this whole thing was and delete it. Anyway, video beginneth. So you know how I said I wasn't going to do a video on the Crusader tank anytime soon? <laughs> I lied. British tanks! There they are! <laughs> look at them! The sheer raw power of British engineering! Christ, look at that one! Wouldn't want to meet that one in a dark alley. But why are British tanks? Well, Britain has three ways of winning wars. First, is to make sure your officer corps is stuffed full of decrepit old inbred rich posh layabouts who know more about table manners than tactics, solve a problem by throwing soldiers at it, suffer massive casualties, retreat, shout huzzah, and then claim victory anyway. Second, is to put someone actually competent in charge who brings the full power and might of Britannia crashing down upon the problem in a way that really shouldn't work, but somehow does. Third is to say you'll help, let your ally do all the fighting, retreat when it goes badly, and then just Wallace and Gromit your way out of the situation. And that is pretty much what Britain did in the Second World War. Surrounded on all sides with no army, no resources, a starving populace, a land invasion imminent, the sky filled with enemy bombers, the ocean with submarines, and an economy built by pacifists and based on the idea that a world war would never happen again, Britain was desperate. And in that desperation, they birthed an idea. To defeat the Nazis, they would construct an elaborate series of contraptions, which they did. From the great beach-climbing rocket-powered Pangen drum, to the handheld spring-mortar anti-tank Piet, to the rocket-propelled aerial minefield with the mines and little parachutes, that is a thing that does exist, to the flying jeep, a bomb that could cause earthquakes, and most famously, an aircraft carrier made out of ice. Some of these worked, most of them did not, because they were the work of mental people. And British tanks sort of follow this exact same pattern. Each design is built by a separate madman, each attempting to fix a problem they assume to be what a modern battle will entail, and each going about it in a completely different way. And British generals were not exactly helping the situation, because they'd been quick to accept and even pioneer the idea of mechanised warfare, something commonly mislabeled as Blitzkrieg and attributed to the Germans, but the idea of exactly what kind of tank this style of warfare would require was not hugely understood. Now, you'd be wrong to think that there was an argument at the War Office which led to the compromise of cavalry and infantry tank development proceeding in different directions, fast tank to replace the cavalry, and so on and so forth. No, they'd all agreed that what they were doing was the best way. The problem was the cavalry was refusing to give up their horses and had to be bullied into it, and then only finally mechanising all cavalry units in Britain in 1939, though it would be well into 1942 before this included all foreign legions, with the last great cavalry charge of the British Empire occurring in Burma in 1942, when the Burmese frontier force consisting of cavalry from India, granted led by the British, charged the Japanese. It went about as well as you expect. But yes, several of the British divisions upon arriving in Africa in 1941 still had horses with them, though by then they were mostly ceremonial or for pulling things or as pets. I'm an officer, I get to have my bloody horse with me if I want. You can't take it away from me. No, I should write a letter to the king himself. It's, as I imagine what, what was happening at, at the time. Anyway, so Britain wanted fast tanks doing what the cavalry always pretty much did. Uh, flank attacks, breakthroughs, scouting, etc, etc. So speed was essential. 
but it also wants infantry tanks for supporting infantry, which, in spite of recognising the future of warfare and the direction it was going on, decide that speed is not essential. Uh, I mean, quite literally, in every design spec considered by the Ministry of Defence, being able to cross trenches and having more machine guns than the typical American strapped to it were more desirable traits than if or not it could actually move, since, as they reckoned, in our future warfare of mechanised troops performing large-scale flanking and breakthrough manoeuvres to capture objectives, secure supply lines, and encircle the enemy, why would anyone be travelling faster than walking pace? This kind of thought led to the TOG, which, uh, I mean, well, there that is. And the Matilda, because everyone in Britain was shitting themselves over just how expensive tank warfare might become, and we barely have any tanks, rapidly produce the cheapest tank you possibly can, give it a ludicrous amount of armour, a one-man turret, and a machine gun. Because why would it need anything else? It's shooting at infantry. What do you mean, cover? Why would they take cover? That's not very sporting of them, is it? Oh, and the top speed of the thing is somewhere between a turtle and the walking pace of an elderly couple when you're trying to get past them in the shopping aisle. However, having been forced to leave behind all of its equipment in France, and with invasion seemingly mere days away, and nothing to fight back with outside of a polite yet stern letter, a lot of British tanks produced in this era would be ordered in a panic off the drawing board, with no real evaluation as to their capabilities, examples being the Matilda II and the Valentine respectively. Now, the Crusader was put through trials, but it was only ever matched against its direct and awful competitor, the Conventor tank. Convented, convent, the, the, frickin, this one. Seen here, forklifting a Churchill after his daily 12th champagne bottle breakfast buffet. This footage, by the way, is from a British propaganda film, in which time, every time Churchill appears on screen, there is rapturous applause. Applaud! Applaud when you see the great leader! No, not that one! Speaking of the Convenator, the Covenanter, that thing, after its design was rejected for frontline use, Britain had about 300 of them just, you know, sitting about. Uh, they were mainly used for training, but then someone came up with the idea of a Home Guard armoured division. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Home Guard were a large group of volunteers, originally called the LDV, or the local defence volunteers, but most famously were known as Dad's Army. They were made up of people too ill or too old or sometimes just too young to join the regular army, who in lieu of equipment were to creatively defend the nation during an invasion, leading them to raiding museums and pushing everything from trebuchets, crossbows and black powder cannons into service, or to strapping boiler plates to your car. I'll maybe do a video in the future about this because honestly the weird and wacky and psychotic world of the LTV does not get enough attention. Now honestly, sometimes I wish Germany had invaded Great Britain, j just for the comedic Wallace and Gromit shenanigans that would have ensued. But anyway, British tanks. So, where the fuck do you begin? <laughs> well you start at 1920s and you build this gigantic tank with a lot of turrets. And then you realise that's dumb, so you take the turrets off. Now put them back on. Now take them off again. Now put one back on. Now take it off. Now that is British tank design in a nutshell. And I have admitted before, and I shall do so again, I used to be a bit of a tearboo. I know, how dare I? But thing is, back then, anything popular and World War II based was always America this, America that, here's Germany, and if we're lucky, the Russians will get a mention. As far as the main bulk of the shit show that was the military enthusiast community, as it was back then, Britain might have well as done nothing in World War II. America rode in, saved its ass like it did in the First World War, and how dare we complain, because tidy islands, size of Texas, blah 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 blah, etc, etc. I'll give you an example of how bad this was. Company of Heroes, not the first one, not the shit second one, had an expansion that added two new factions. The SS, sorry, the Panzer Elite, and the British. And would you believe, in some multiplayer matches, I would get booted out for playing as the British, because only dumb people play as Britain. <laughs> this was until everyone realised that the British arty doctrine path is the most OP thing in the existence of that game. You build three 25 pounders and just nuke your enemy into rage quitting. Anyway, but when you are British, and you're in that environment, you start to develop a uh, mentality. And that mentality is, fuck you, America! I shall defend the honour of my nation! Keyboard warriors, assemble! So, you know, it's it's taken a long time to kind of, you know, just dial that back a bit, you know? 
history. <laughs> so, problems of British tax. And yes, I know this video is supposed to be in, in defense of the Crusader. I'm getting there. Shush. Problems of British tax start with the 1924 Railways Act. <laughs> Only the top tier excitement on this channel. And uh, now this is an act that is absolutely 100% not trying to prevent big American truck companies from making the railway obsolete by making it law that any cargo over four tons has to travel by rail. Which was great for the railways who got to keep building obsolete steam trains right up to the 1970s until suddenly had to replace them all with diesel trains in a time where any random fucker could just walk into the Department of Transport with a crayon drawing and say, I've designed train and British Rail would go, great, build us 300 please. Which is why when it comes to British diesel trains of the 1970s and 80s, there are so fucking many of them and they're all weird as fuck. So, good for the railway companies, but bad if a war suddenly happened and you suddenly needed a lot of tanks and trucks and armoured cars and various other things, and that's a bit of an issue when you find that the biggest thing your country has produced is a three-ton Bedford. Fun. Now, add to this fact that Britain had lost all of its equipment, and I mean all of its equipment in France, and suddenly a lot of pressure was applied to an economy that had been built by pacifists on the understanding that another world war would never happen until everyone in the current government was either dead or couldn't take the blame. Add to that the very sudden material shortage, a food shortage, and you're being blockaded by one of the most efficient and ruthless U-boat navies in the world, and then Germany starts invading you. And you can imagine why when Britain took stock of its situation, just a little bit of poo came out. Let me give you an example. All of the Enfield rifles Britain took to France, that was all of them. That was all they had. They could build more of them, but the factory that had built them had expanded during World War I, but during the interwar period, it had really only produced limited runs of experimental rifles. A hundred here, a hundred here, you know, and all that the British really didn't want because they were, they were just too expensive. Uh, and now suddenly they had to build hundreds and thousands of new rifles, plus all the ammunition that they needed, just when all their workers had been drafted into the army. So ammunition in Britain was a little bit in short supply. So short supply, I'll give you another example here. Britain had this ring of steel that looped around London and formed a defensive perimeter right up to about the north of England. Every gun Britain had was on this line, from leftover anti-tank guns, old World War I artillery guns, to guns that had been ripped off decommissioned warships. Each gun on average, on average, so keep in mind that means half of them had less than this, 10 shells each. So, and Germany had the capability and invaded right there and then, Britain's chances of holding out were about as fucked as a femboy at a furry convention. Thankfully, they didn't. Germany proclaimed it needed total air superiority before a land invasion could begin, and Operation Silo was more of an intimidation tactic, not an actual battle plan. So, with no army, no air force, a navy that desperately needed more destroyers to escort convoys, and now an air invasion underway, Britain needed to build everything very, very quickly, and priority was given to aircraft and warships. The tanks had to make do with whatever was left over, which was train factories, and, and, and you know, we've been over that. Alright, fine! So the British cruiser tank starts off with the A9. Uh, this was designed to be cheap, easy to produce, and have as many off-the-shelf components as possible. It was thinly armoured, and though accepted and put into service as the cruiser Mark I, only about a hundred were ever built, before being replaced by the Mark II. Uh, this removed the stupid frontal turrets and up-armoured the entire vehicle. But it wouldn't be until a little later that the British became interested in something called the Christie's Suspension. Oh boy. Experiments with the Christie design led to the A-13, the Cruiser Mark III, the cutest tank ever built and a, honestly a personal favourite of mine. Honestly, I don't play War Thunder anymore, but when I did, this was the tank I'd dick around in. I love it. The A-13 was fast and combined at speed with a pretty decent at the time two-pounder gun, making it everything Britain wanted in a cruiser tank that was eventually upgraded and mass-produced with the additional spaced armour. But it still 
wasn't enough. The Brits were concerned that though their tanks could be fast, that thin armour would make them vulnerable to anti-tank rifles, to which was said a, a tank can be as fast as it wants, but no tank can be faster than a speeding bullet. So Nuffield Liberty was contracted to come up with some designs, combining their engine with uh, the Christie suspension, to create a sort of medium cruiser tank, one that was fast, armed with a two-pounder, and had a Christie suspension. <laughs> oh god. And so, the results, the two results in fact, were the Covenanter and the Crusader, with the Crusader becoming the favourite choice, because the Covenanter was a fucking piece of shit. Now, when you hear tales of the Crusader, you could be forgiven for thinking that this is the most unreliable tank in history, as anyone who talks about it immediately starts with how unreliable it was, as if every other tank at the time wasn't also suffering reliability issues. Even David Fletcher, Tank Jesus, during a tank chat on the Crusader, cannot resist but talk about its reliability issues. And the thing is, that's not untrue. This tank was forever breaking down, and the main factor behind it was the air filters, which were located on the outside and were in the perfect position that when the tank moved through the loose ground, huge dust clouds got kicked up behind it, and that would just blow straight into the air filters and clog them up. Now, this was not unique to the Crusader. I mean, there has been such a huge emphasis that has been placed on this being something that the British, and only the British, suffered. But of course the Germans suffered it too, or did it never occur to any of you why there are no stugs in the desert? Now again, this is just going back to the double standard of historians. German tanks were commonly known to be unreliable under stress and had difficulty coping with the harsh terrain, unless they were in the desert, where they worked perfectly all the time. Now why is this? Now, believe it or not, there is not a lot of information out there from the German perspective, and a lot of what we do have comes from a very specific source. That source is, and has remained, the biggest source of disinformation of the Africa campaign. In spite of numerous attempts to prove that what it says is a lot of bullshit, it has remained one of the biggest checked out items at the Imperial War Museum where it is housed. Item number 5668 if you want to go check yourself. It was published as a book, translated into numerous languages, and is even for sale at the Tank Museum. The Diaries of One Erwin Rommel. <laughs> and the myths that surround Erwin Rommel could fill a library, and he deserves a video all of his own. Don't worry, his time will come. But for all his reputation as a military strategical genius, his real genius was in propaganda. The cameras back in Germany loved him, and Gorbals found that film reels showing the setting of the African sun, glinting of well-presented tank formations, was far more romantic and far more appealing to audiences than the barren steppes of Russia and troops fighting through mud and rain. Gorbals would turn the entire Africa campaign into a propaganda war. Rommel would be given his own camera team, with each and every shot reviewed by Rommel himself, and if the lighting was wrong or if he didn't look heroic enough, the entire scene was reshot. Rommel has been given something very few of us will ever have in our lives. He got to write his own legacy. Every piece of footage, every report which mentioned him, even his own diaries, were carefully curated to create the story of the Desert Fox, a man of poor birth, raised through the ranks through his own cunning, brilliance and heroics, despised by the other generals for not being Bavarian, and cast out to the desert with second-rate equipment and soldiers, in which he would mould into an elite force and fight a hellish war against the British, outsmarting them at every move, blaming his failures and the generals sent to supervise him, who would squabble over resources and the Italians. Now Hitler saw the Desert War as a less important secondary front, and with his attention entirely focused on Russia, Rommel was pretty much allowed to do as he pleased, provided the reports which came back were always good news. His legacy was allowed to continue largely unquestioned, and after the war, and with West Germany now a founding part of the NATO alliance, the public who had gone for years both hating and fearing Germany had to now suddenly reverse and start liking them again. This is where the idea of the honourable German general, who commanded respect and had nothing to do with any war crimes, <laughs> became a highly beneficial propaganda piece to help portray our once enemies, now friends. Now it's at this point of history we start to see the division between Germany and the Nazis and popular media. The SS and Hitler's elites become the scapegoats and are blamed for some of Hitler's more interesting policies that you're not allowed to talk about on YouTube, and the Wehrmacht, the uh, regular army of Germany, 
becomes sterilized. They were not the SS, not the Nazis. They were just regular Germans who were misled, and they're actually just regular people like you or me. Now, this is where we get the birth of the clean Wehrmacht myth, one of the most persistent and annoying myths of the Second World War. But it also gives birth to the idea of the noble German general. And while many others would publish writings trying to present themselves in a better light, it would be Rommel, who never served on the Eastern Front, who never committed any war crimes, <laughs> and was respectable, well-liked, handsome and cunning, like a fox. And best of all, he wasn't a member of the Nazi party, and may have even been implicated into a plot to kill Hitler which was totally because he was secretly good and not at all to advance his own political career. Overnight, Rommel goes from being a name on an intelligence report to a worthy adversary. His son is granted numerous awards and becomes friends with both Patton and Montgomery. Rommel, or at least the Rommel his legacy of propaganda has created, becomes the new face of the German army. And if Germany has a few more like him, then the Soviets don't stand a chance. Now this bleeds into our next problem. And it's a big one. As much as Rommel is a work of propaganda, the Americans would go on to produce their own, far worse version. Patton. Patton is another persona often regaled as being a military genius, feared and respected by the enemy, but in reality was a master of propaganda. America's problem was that support for the war was low. Britain was the old enemy, and while the two had come together briefly at the end of the First World War, it had been an alliance of mutual understanding, and America's position on Europe was a largely economic one. When America officially entered the war after the attacks on Pearl Harbor, you need to understand it hadn't been that long ago that the first battle of the Second World War had taken place in Times Square over which side America should support. But now, after being war crimed by the Japanese, Americans were naturally frustrated at why American troops were being shipped to a desert on the other side of the world from Japan to deal with an enemy that was, quite frankly, someone else's problem. Most Americans were confused as to why they had to be involved in this war while Japan loomed over them. They considered the European theatre to be a largely British show, and were not in favour of sending people off to die for those slimy redcoats. What the Americans needed was a hero, and Patton gave them just that. A brave, smart-looking, badass tank commander who led from the front, who gave outrageous speeches, who swore and smoked, gosh, how daring, and who didn't listen to his British superiors. The propaganda reels loved him and his image of smart-looking, professional American soldiers. It gave the Americans hope, both at home and in the US Army. It made them feel like they were actually part of the war and fully capable of kicking some ass, as opposed to just helping out the limeys. This all means that the American perspective of the Desert War is typically told from his perspective. America talks about America, so what the British were doing before America showed up is largely unimportant. Hence why everything you read about British tanks in the desert, you largely hear about how bad it went for the British, how their tanks were too thinly armoured, unreliable and had weak guns, up until 1941 in Operation Crusader, when the British get the American M3 Lee, which takes Rommel completely by surprise. Huge victory for the British! And then at the second battle of El Alamein, where the British show up with yet another American tank, the Sherman, taking Rommel completely by surprise again. Great victory for the British. But has all of this been taken just a little bit out of context? Now, as much as the emphasis has always been placed on Britain not succeeding until it gets American-built tanks, there is a lot of misconception as to the value those tanks had on Britain's success in the Africa campaign. You see... Even before those M3 Lees arrived, Rommel's tanks were not exactly performing well. Uh, though through his diaries, Rommel insists that by the end of 1941, all of his tanks were replaced by the Panzer III J. In actuality, half of his force was Panzer Is and Twos, and out of the Panzer Threes he did have, less than half were equipped with a longer 50mm gun. Just to correct a common mistake, not all Mark III Js have that longer gun. The J designation was for a Panzer III that had been up-armoured. The longer gun variant was the L, though some Js did actually have it. 
See, there's a few sources out there that, that see Panzer 3Js being listed as having arrived in Africa and have presumed them to in fact be Ls. It's a minor detail, most people get it right, but it is why you see a lot of discrepancy between Africa Corps tank numbers. Contrary to popular belief, British tanks had very little problems facing off against their German opponents, with both the Crusader and the Panzer III able to kill each other at similar ranges. But, you may exclaim, we, we have British war diaries, hundreds of them, and a lot of them, especially by tankers, seem absolutely thrilled at getting the idea of an American tank. Okay, so there are two issues here. Firstly, you'd be wrong to assume that the M3 Lee and the Shermans replaced the Crusader tanks in Africa. They did not. Britain had something of a tank shortage, so when the Africa War began, everything it had left was being pushed into service. This included the old cruiser models, many of which, because they had done rather well against the Italians and even the early German tanks, remained in service. Thus, British tank units remained a hodgepodge of different tanks. Though there were some attempts to standardise this, it wasn't uncommon for a single tank unit to have a Mark I, a Mark II, a Crusader, and a Stuart, all tanks with widely different capabilities and operating styles in one unit. So about half the tanks the British actually had were reserve tanks, not particularly well maintained, falling apart from the harsh desert conditions they were being forced to fight in, so of course they were absolutely overjoyed to be getting something more modern and a hell of a lot more powerful. I mean, if you've been stuck in the desert for over a year with this Mark I cruiser tank rattling all around you, knowing there's less than an inch of hot steel between you, a German shell, and a big box of ammo, if your commander were to come along to you and say, all right, get rid of that thing, he's an M3 Lee. It's like Christmas come early, it's fantastic! The other issue, of course, is that while everyone focuses on the unreliability of the Crusader, it kind of glosses over one of the main issues. The Crusader has a very low profile, it was designed to be as small as possible, meaning it could be lighter and much harder to hit. This also made the tank incredibly cramped inside, maybe not as cramped as the T-34, but still pretty uncomfortable and probably actually a lot worse than the T-34 because, well, these tanks were made of steel in a desert with no air conditioning. A few diaries I have read talk about the crew being mostly naked inside, so an American tank that wasn't so cramped was like a dream come true. Finally, I can drive the tank without having to smell my commander's sweaty ball sack. Of course, the M3 Lee had its own problems. It could not hold down and still fire its primary gun. Its silhouette was stupidly high, and that main gun was not only difficult to aim, when attempting to fire on the move, it caused the whole tank to swing violently to the side. It was also a bit of a gas guzzler, and its operational range was far below what the Brits had been used to. The Stuart had a similar problem. By 1942, the Sherman has arrived. Americans and a lot of Brits like to place emphasis on this being the moment the Brits finally have a tank capable of taking out the German panzers. But as I said earlier, contrary to popular belief, the British tanks had relatively no issues in dealing with their German counterparts. In fact, in many ways, a lot of British tanks were superior to the things they faced. I mean, Panzer 1s and 2s were theoretically useless. The Panzer 3 was a pretty even match, even by the time the newer L models had began to arrive, which had given the Germans back the advantage in range. The Brits had started to upgrade the Crusaders with a more powerful 6-pounder gun, which negated that advantage. The Mark III Crusader also introduced ventilation fans, a bigger engine with a more powerful water cooling system, which negated that air filter problem, and even thicker armour. The Panzer IV was largely outclassed by everything else, being sluggish and difficult to operate in the terrain, and with that low-velocity 75mm gun, it could barely penetrate anything. Uh, the F2 variant, with its much, much more powerful and longer 75mm cannon, did help make the Panzer III one of the more deadly tanks of the desert, uh, but these were prioritised for the Eastern Front, and Rommel would only receive 27 of them. Now, the arrival of the Sherman would coincide with a lot of changes to the way the British operated in the desert. The upgraded Crusader was one of them, along with the introduction of the new Churchill tanks. Uh, Matildas were being replaced by the Valentine, etc, etc, etc. But there was one more major massive change. I know, I know, this is a video about the Crusader. Why am I going back to the T-34? Well. I want to talk to you about the double standards of the lazy historian, briefly. I've mentioned it before, and its meaning isn't really too hard to penetrate. Now, if you were to scroll through the comments on my video about the T-34, you'll find hundreds upon hundreds of people all saying the same thing. Numbers. 
It's all about numbers. Numbers matter. Blah, 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 blah. Which, uh, I, I, you know, if you want to embarrass yourself by saying that, that's fine. I mean, it's bullshit, and I think you know it's bullshit, but let me explain why the T-34 is important here, okay? You see, the double standard is when talking about the T-34, all anyone can ever talk about is how the Eastern Front was a war of attrition, a, a numbers war. This is because the average person hasn't sat the fuck down and thought about what that actually means. That people don't typically think. Something else tells them what to think, and, and then they think that thing until something else comes along and contradicts it. And either they change what they think, or, or they double down and proclaim that the new information must be wrong, because they once heard differently, and, and that's how you end up with commie boos and thereaboos and so on and so forth. I use commie boos instead of tankies because tankies is more of a political reference, and it, 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 it's, it's an old British term for members of the Communist Party, so I, I prefer commie boos because it's... I don't know, it just sounds more fun, to be honest. Some people like that will happily tell you, ah yes, the T-34 was a terrible tank, but they sure built a lot of them, and that's what mattered, because numbers matter in a war. But when it comes to Rommel, well, by mid-1941, he has 30 serviceable tanks. The British have 600, and yet, he was still winning. He was still winning battles. He, he was still able to beat back the British in spite of being so ridiculously outnumbered. So to try and explain that, people jump on the first thing they've heard about Rommel. Ah, but he was a cunning fox of a man. The Desert Fox, a military tactical genius. And for some reason, the people who say this shit never seem to be able to quite connect the dots. Like they seem to think that Russia didn't have any good generals. <laughs> Bad example, but, but, but serious. Well, the romance that surrounds the Africa campaign has always highlighted it as being an armoured duel in the sand. The reality was, it was an infantry war, much like every other theatre of World War II, regardless of what you might have heard. Alright, apart from the naval ones, they were not infantry, they were battleship you, you get my you, you get my point. And the tactics of that infantry duel played a far more important role than the sheer number of tanks involved. Rommel was famously a tactician. He had exactly two tactics. I mean, in spite of furiously outnumbering the Germans, the British were organised into long defensive lines, for a reason I'll explain in a moment, which relied on static positions stretched out across an entire front. This meant that Rommel could choose one section along that front and concentrate all his forces onto it, overwhelming whatever was there and penetrating enemy lines. His second tactic was to send out a few of his lighter tanks, get the attention of the British who would rush forward and then retreat those tanks, and when the British gave chase, he would lure them into a pre-prepared ambush, where his 88mm cannons could just rip the enemy tanks to shreds. Now Rommel got away with these kind of things for so long because of doctrine. The British army had a very, very strict doctrine, and deviating from that doctrine was not encouraged, or really allowed. The armoured doctrine the British were following was from the days where tank divisions were cavalry divisions. If the enemy retreated, you followed. They were trained to take advantage of a breakdown in ranks and push through following standard breakthrough protocols. And when under fire from emplaced artillery or guns, they would go hulled down. This is where you, you get your tank and you, you find either a ridge to set behind or you bury its hull in the dirt and the sand, exposing only the turret. And while such an action made sense in making the tank less of a target, in reality it made the tanks sitting ducks for the 88mm guns, operating at a range far beyond what the Crusaders could realistically counter. And even then, the two-pounder gun had only armour-piercing ammunition is the line that normally follows. There was high explosive ammunition available for the two-pounder, but it has been described to me as next to useless by someone who knows better. Very much like the high explosive ammunition on the 50mm of the Panzer III. Not that anyone talks about how shit that was. Well, it was. The Panzer III had about the same capability to deal with British anti-tank guns as a Verabu has to get laid. Hence why things like the 25-pounder, which was supplied with an armour-piercing shell and used as an anti-tank gun, which under no circumstances should that ever have been allowed to happen, proved to do quite well. But the arrival of the Sherman coincides with Britain deciding to flip the cards and go for option two, actually putting someone competent in charge. One... Bernard Montgomery. Now, uh, 
afraid Akinlek wasn't a bad commander per se. I mean, I mean, like Rommel, he led from the front, putting around in his Matilda too, but he was a veteran of the First World War. He'd seen an entire generation wiped out and didn't want that to happen again. As a result, he was disinclined to attack the Germans head on, and preferred to try and whittle the Germans down using heavy defensive fortifications and only really attacking when he had about a 2 to 1 advantage in numbers. Now this pissed Churchill off. Churchill saw the Africa War as not only a huge drain on resources, but an opportunity to show that Britain still had teeth. Having it go on for years was not an option, and Auchinleck's cautiousness and defensive attitude had allowed Rommel to regroup and rebuild when there had been several points where a single concentrated attack could have wiped him out. Remember how I said by mid-1941 they had 30 tanks to Britain's 600? That was one of them, right after the first battle of El Alamein. So Akinluck was sacked. His replacement is stuffed onto a plane, which is immediately shot down, so now Monty is in command. By this time, both sides were exhausted. Supply lines were overstretched, and the soldiers were weak from the harsh desert conditions. And Monty's first plan of action was to reorganise the entire army, pulling exhausted units off the front lines and allowing them to rest, and more importantly, Bathe. The Brits also began constructing dedicated pits for toilets in their camp. Both of these things would not only improve morale for the troops, and also help prevent disease. The same could not be said for the German side, with most units remaining on the front lines for the duration of the campaign, and at night, when he needed to relieve himself, the honourable, professional, elite and sophisticated German soldier would wander off into the desert and shit wherever he liked, like he'd been taught table manners by the fucking French. This encouraged flies, which would follow the Germans wherever they went, spreading all sorts of nasty diseases that have really long names. Monty's second plan was to put a stop to all the obvious bullshit the Brits had been falling for. Now when the German tanks retreated, rather than the British falling them into well-placed ambushes, the 88s would be answered with artillery fire and aircraft, quickly turning them from the most feared weapon of the desert into a useless death trap for its crew. He would also enact the idea of a fluid defence, which, which I shall demonstrate for you on this no expense spared high graphics child's drawing program. So you got these big blocks defenders like this. In a static defence, they are their duggins. You have a lot of concentrated firepower. But, but like I said, Rommel could just get his entire army, focus on one of these boxes, and just overwhelm whatever was there. Now a better idea is layered defences, where you get rows of these boxes overlapping like this. So if a breakthrough occurs, you've now got two defence boxes in front of them. But a fluid defence, something that is still used even today, is you have these boxes but rather than being full defensive boxes with huge fortifications, they are holdout boxes. They are expected to be able to hold out for a certain amount of time, and between them you have these large response units, usually tanks, that can move very fast and very quickly and reinforce whatever is under attack, while other response units that are too far away to respond in time can start pushing forward into the counter-attack or even an encircle manoeuvre. Now, I mean, that's the basics of fluid defensive warfare, and about 50 people in the comments will tell me, no, you're wrong, that's not how it works. But this is basically what happened to Rommel. I mean, that encirclement failed, but it left him with 20 tanks and barely any trucks. He would end the Africa campaign under siege, with no fuel to mount an offensive, and almost no drinking water to retreat back into the desert. He would be summoned back to Germany to personally explain to Hitler the realities of the Africa campaign. Now, of course, there's a lot of details I've glossed over. There's this whole attrition raiding war going on, there's supply line issues, there's Rommel's faint attacks being exposed by the code-breaking team, the crazy shit the French were up to, the SAS, the combined warfare things the Brits did, uh, and the Americans were also there, and Rommel underestimating the Americans would also play a huge part. You may be thinking, there's a pig. What the fuck does any of this have to do with the Crusader? Alright, shut up. No, no, I love you, it's fine. Point of all this is that people know some tanks from the Second World War. Uh, they have their favourites and they will have the ones they laugh at, but generally what they understand about them is the same basic lines that have been repeated to them for the past however many years it's fucking been. This one is unreliable, this one has super thick armour, this one was only good in large numbers, this one was the most effective, and so on and so forth. And we, as enthusiasts, have this very compartmentalised view of wars and battles. We typically see tanks as being independent units, shooting at enemy tanks in a field, and its ability to do that independently becomes the focus of which tank is the best. 
and we often forget that these units are not designed to work independently, but as part of a larger whole, with infantry support and artillery. That's why idiots, normally some tea-drinking, cardigan-wearing computer IT consultant from the West Coast, using his LinkedIn profile as his YouTube avatar, and probably also his Tinder profile, will sit there and talk at length about how the T-34 won the war for the Russians, which I mean, if you have the balls to come here and in front of all these people and say that with your shit-eating grin, one of the dumbest statements you possibly can, and then act like you've schooled the historian with your facts and logic, that's on you. I can't wait to hear what other perils of wisdom fart from that mouth of yours. And what next? Oh, it took five Shermans to kill a tiger. Actually, oh my god, daring army. If that is you, do me a kindness. Shut, and I cannot stress this enough, the fuck up. Amateurs will often snort at the idea of a tank being designed for infantry support, and back in the bad old days a lot of people believed that American and British tanks were inferior because they had been designed with the idea of supporting infantry, and that's why German tanks, in quotation marks, were superior, because they'd be designed to fight other tanks. And that belief became the norm, because it was a very simple solution to a very complicated thing. And from that, we just hurtled down this rabbit hole. I mean, I call it the double standard. People hold each tank to a different standard. Examples, the reliability problems of the Panther are paramount to its failure as a tank. But the T-34 gets a free pass. The two-pounder was awful because it didn't have high explosive rounds, but the Panzer III, which has the same problem, is beloved by many, even though both tanks required very rare variants of other tanks to follow it around, lobbing large artillery shells at things like anti-tank guns, which it just simply could not handle. The Crusader was a fine tank, not perfect. It was cramped, the early ones were badly made, they lacked good sights for the commander, the frontal machine gun turret was useless and hardly ever used, and the later upgun variants reduced the turret from a three-man to a two-man operation. But none of these issues are unique to the Crusader. It had decent armour, it was well designed, it was fairly comfortable to ride in, it had a soft steel interior which protected the crew from spalling or those rivets and bolts from bouncing around and maiming the crew. It could actually fire on the move, which made you know, it almost unique. It was fast, it didn't need to have its engine turned over every few hours to stop it seizing up, or have the entire engine lubricated every day to stop it exploding. It had an exceptionally good fuel range, giving it a huge advantage over the German tanks, and it was one of the first tanks to introduce armoured storage bins. Very few Crusaders would explode when hit, which meant that most of the crew would survive and go on to crew other tanks, meaning the Brits gained a lot of good experience, and would use that experience in other campaigns. US tankers in the desert highly valued the experience of British tankers, because early American training, especially for tankers, just wasn't very good, and many would study British expertise and manuals in those early campaigns, which probably saved a lot of lives. The Crusader has been dealt a bad hand over the years. It's sort of dismissed as a failure, not considered with any degree of importance, and it's the Lee and the Sherman that end up with all the glory. But I'm hoping now, perhaps I've changed your mind, maybe now you'll look at the Crusader and understand that yeah, some things are not as good as people like to claim they are, but some things are not as bad as people like to claim either. Anyway, I've got a tequila fondue that's been calling my name for about an hour now, I'm going to go increase my chances of liver failure. I'd invite you to come join me, uh, but I don't want to. Good night. Them all to you, and 
Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. <laughs>